It's my great pleasure to introduce our second keynote for the Pathways to Privacy Symposium. Eloise Graton is a partner at Borden Ladner Gervais LLP, specializing in the fields of protection of privacy and information technology law. She advises clients from various industrial sectors on legal, practical, and ethical issues relating to the protection of privacy or anti-spam legislation in connection with their new projects, products, practices, or technologies, providing them both nationally and internationally with strategic advice on matters of risk management and regulatory compliance, advising as, as to best business practices, conducting privacy audits or privacy impact assessments, and assisting them in crisis management. You know, when someone's starting a, a class action against you and such things. Eloise is one of Canada's foremost experts in the field of privacy and is recognized as the go-to person relied upon by both federal and provincial privacy commissioners, as well as the federal government. She's testified before the House of Commons, the Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics. She's a member of Quebec's Review Committee on Government Orientations Respecting Transparency, Respect for Privacy and the Protection of Personal Information. She's published several books on the protection of privacy issues, which have been cited by the Supreme Court of Canada. Recent works include, but are not limited to, The Practical Guide to E-Commerce and Internet Law, published in 2015, Privacy in the Workplace, published in 2014, and Understanding Personal Information, Managing Privacy Risks, published by 2013. There's about a book a year going back, or a few years. Eloise has been mentioned by Lexpert, uh, as being uh, an expert in both 2013 and 2014 in privacy law, and has taught the course Droit de la protection des renseignements personnels et uh, technologie d'information at Université de Montréal for several years. She's also called upon regularly to comment on news reports dealing with uh, new media issues. Eloise Graton completed a doctorate degree in privacy law from Université de Paris II and Université de Montréal. The title of Eloise's talk is as you can see, are privacy laws adequately protecting and servicing privacy? Thank you for the very nice introduction and also thank you for the invitation. I'm absolutely delighted to be, to be here today, to be part of this wonderful event and to be, sharing, uh, be, be, to be able to share my thoughts on privacy laws and on whether they are uh, doing uh, a good job um, nowadays in 2015. Um, so what is privacy? At some point in time, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, we decided that we were going to uh, conceptualize privacy as having individuals in control of their personal information. It made sense at that point in time, but, but, but there has been a different concept of, of privacy in the last 100 years. At some point, it, it was the right to be let alone, and at some point in time, it was the right uh, to, to protect one's home and one's family, uh, and so on. Um, at that point, though, uh, there was the, the, the concern was that there, were, there was more and more uh, um, automated data banks containing personal information, and the, the, the fear was that businesses, organizations, public sector, private sector were going to be exchanging databases uh, without the knowledge of individuals. So at some point in time, decisions would be made uh, which would have an impact on the individuals, and they would not know, uh, there would be a, some, some form of a lack of transparency. People would not realize that, oh, this, this company has this information about me, I didn't know about that. Um, so it made sense, but we have to keep in mind that um, this, this control concept of privacy or the fair information practices, which have been incorporated in the data protection laws, uh, which have been enacted uh, throughout the globe in the last few, few 40 years, um, date back, from the, um, back to the early uh, 70s. So we have, um, we're still under that concept and, and things have evolved. So. Um, there are some challenge with this notice and choice approach. So um, are, are the fair information practices or having individuals in control of their person, personal information is also re often referred to as the notice and choice approach. So notice, you, give, uh, you, you, you have to be transparent as to the kind of information that you're collecting. Usually it's done in the, through um, disclosing a privacy policy. And choice, you get consent. Um, again, this made sense in, in early 70s. Um, but it's more and more of a challenge. 
for various reasons. So on the notice part, um, it's not so, um, so much realistic anymore to, um, to expect consumers to read every single policy as they go through their day. So there's tons of studies that say, for instance, that you know, if we took, actually took the time to read every single policy uh, that we come across in our day, it would probably take us 31 hours a, a year or a whole week, uh, which makes no sense. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And another thing is that it's, um, it's kind of putting the burden on the, con the, the user, the consumer, to you know, remain aware of all the changes that are taking place, um, which is a very big challenge given that most businesses, online businesses for instance, have a dynamic business model. So things change. Every year there's new features, um, so it's, it's not so realistic. Um, with the Internet of Things, well, all kinds of devices are going to be con connect connected together, household devices, mobile devices. Um, we can end up with um, having to grant consent or being notified here and there um, throughout the day. So we're going to have to think about this one a little bit more and perhaps um, for some type of technologies or for some type of situation, we're going to have to, to step down a little bit from this very st 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 rigid, you know, notice and, and choice um, model. Now with choice, we're supposed to um, get consent and then we're free to, to do what we want with the information and um, more and more uh, obtaining consent is only, it's part of the equation but it doesn't do the job at, at 100%. Um, so you see on this, on this picture it's a, it's a super user. Um, there's a, there was an article uh, published by a US academic called Paul Ohm a few years ago and it was called The Myth of the Super User fear, risk, and harm online. And it was interesting. It was saying, at the end of the day, in many situations, new features, new technologies are designed with a super user in mind, somebody who gets it, who, who is technology savvy, and perhaps um, it shouldn't be the case. So people, in general, get privacy defaults wrong. Um, they don't always get privacy settings. Um, they, and one recent example that we've seen was with the, the Samsung TV a few weeks ago. People said, oh my God, my TV can record my voice and it can transmit my voice to, to third parties. Uh, I, I can't believe this is unacceptable. At the same time, Samsung said, no, 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 I was transparent. There was a, a, you know, a web posting on, on my website. It was very clear that this was a feature. And again, you can activate it or not activate it based on whether you want to use voice recognition with your device. So again, you see where the, it's becoming, there's a fine line as to um, at, at what point are users really aware of how to use a new, a new device or new feature. Another thing to keep in mind is that individuals typically disseminate content more broadly than they intend or is advisable for their own good. And there's been, there's been various studies that, um, that, can, that can confirm this. So one of them um, is a study that was done by Harvard scientists. Um, that um, using bra uh, brain imaging, um, they, they realize that when people talk about themselves in public, the, the, there's a heightened activity in the same brain region associated with re rewards from food, um, money, and sex. So people like sharing things about themselves. Apparently, it's, a, it's, it's, it's human, human nature, it's part, it's part of who we are. There was another study done by the um, Alessandro Acquisti um, and, and the folks from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And um, apparently, uh, individuals are more willing to, to disclose sensitive information after being told that previous respondents have made similar sensitive disclosures. So, call it peer pressure, I'm not sure, but um, apparently, if I tell you how much I have in my bank and how much I weigh, you're probably going to share this information right back. But joking aside, it's something to keep in mind, you know, um, the psychology of the consumer. Um, that we're, we're realizing maybe they're not the best persons to, to, to manage uh, or, or make an, an, an informed choice. The last study is also interesting. So it was a study that was made again by Alessandro Acquisti with some of, uh, the, some of the folks from Harvard and Cambridge. So it was, um, they used as part of the, the study, it was university students um, and they pretended that they wanted to build a new uh, online social network. So they asked um, the students, so relatively educated people, right? They're in, in university, young, relatively young generation using uh, technology devices. And they asked them all kinds of questions to see 
where people um, foresee the risk in disclosing information on uh, social networks. And they said it's, there's a, a control paradox. So the, the name of the study is, is, is called Misplaced Confidence, uh, Privacy and the Control Paradox. So uh, the result of, the, of this uh, study showed that if people felt that if they were in control of the initial disclosure, you know, the first time you post information online, um, they, didn't really, they, they saw absolutely no problem as having no control afterwards as to where this information would end up. Um, so they were, as long as they had the control, that's what counted in their head. They didn't, they didn't realize that there was a risk. And if, and if um, they, so they switched it around, they said, okay, in, in another scenario, you don't have control over the uh, original, the first disclosure, but you have control over further dissemination. They said, oh, no, it's, that's okay. I want the control over the original disclosure. So you see that people don't quite uh, grasp the exact risk of putting information out online. Um, another one is, is, is you know, it's a, they struggle in many cases to keep up with te technological developments. And again, uh, Carnegie Mellon University had done a study uh, for um, with a, a, a group of people with uh, new tools to manage online behavioral advertising. So they gave them tools, they sat with them on the web, they explained how th these tools worked. Um, this is how you can block an ad, this is how you can modify your profile, this is how you could be using the tool. And at the end of the study, they're, they're, in their conclusion, they said, there are significant challenges in providing easy to use tools that give users meaningful, meaningful control without interfering with their use of the web. Even with additional education and better user interfaces, it is not clear whether users are capable of making meaningful choices about trackers. So, okay, now that we know this, what do we do? Um, one other analogy that I wanted to make, there was a, a um, Supreme Court decision in 2012, um, which, which I found very interesting. So it was a uh, Jean-Marc Richard, so it was, it was um, a Supreme Court decision that related to the interpretation to give to um, uh, an advertisement under the Quebec Consumer Protection Act. So in that case, Jean-Marc Richard received, you know, our, sweeps, uh, our sweepstakes results are now final and you've won a million dollars. And, and, and we've received sometimes these types of, you know, advertising. We disregard them. We know we didn't win the money. Well, he thought he had one. And if you read the fine prints, it wasn't quite clear. That it, there's going to be a draw. So clearly, if, you, if, you're, if you're an average user in our, in our view, um, you would know that it's probably not a real contest. So he submitted the coupon. And then he's like, where's my money? So he contacted Time, who said, no, it was a contest, some, some form of advertisement. He's like, well, this, for me, when I read this, I thought I had won the money. So he took this, um, the, the, he sued them, and he went before the Supreme Court, who said, um, in determining whether a commercial representation is false or misleading, the general impression of an advertisement should be assessed through the perspective of an ordinary, hurried purchaser, relatively unsophisticated, and not particularly experienced at detecting the falsehoods or subtleties found in commercial representation. Ouch. So that, that, was, that was the test, and that's what the kind of, of individual that we'd have, we should have in mind when we're um, putting out uh, advertisement. Um, by analogy, the same, perhaps the same type of user should, you know, we should have in mind when we're, we're designing new tools and, and, new, and new types of features. So back to the consent, um, we're granting consent, sometimes it's a free service, um, and, and usually the, these consent are, are relatively broad, right? So the, in the, the Facebook terms of use, it's, you know, we, we could use your information for data research. I'm not sure that Facebook users realized how their information could be used. So recalled, uh, recall last summer there was the, the experiment that was done uh, by Facebook. Um, it, there, was, there was some studies from Germany and from the U.S. that were saying that, you know, they, there was a theory that when people view positive content on Facebook, they get a little bit jealous. You know, you get a good news from somebody. They said, you know, good news, got a new job, look at my new baby, they get jealous. So they call this self-promotion envy spiral. They wanted to test this. So using an algorithm, they tweaked a little bit of the, the, news, the, the type of information that was in the news feed. So all of a sudden, some people would get you know, more positive content in their newsfeed, and some people would get more negative content. 
And what they found was that the people that got more positive content were posting more positive content, and, and, and the same with the people that received. So I said, aha, this, this theory doesn't, doesn't stand. We're not that envious after all. We're actually um, easily contaminated, you know, with emotions on Facebook. Very interesting study, but people got upset. And Facebook to answer, you know, you have agreed to my terms of service, and you know, I, I was very transparent with the fact that I would be using your, your information for data research and service improvement. Um, so a lot of academics have tried to, to make sure that Facebook would be accountable for this activity. So they said maybe it was a human research experiment that required, you know, ethical board approval. Um, it has to be illegal somehow. It doesn't work. You know, we're part of a service. We're, we have already accepted to receiving advertising, but you know, to what extent can we be used and manipulated uh, as part of the service? Another, um, another issue that I want to raise on this uh, no, no, notice and choice uh, model is the fact that um, consent um, sometimes in some situation is not required, but we, and, and we, we have new challenges um, such as a recent case that, 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 that took place in, in Canada, which I'm, I'm about to explain. Uh, bottom line, in a democratic society, um, court files are publicly accessible. And it's, you know, it's always been like that. But there's a major difference between going physically to the courthouse to look into a file and when you know what you're looking for, you have a file number, you know who the defendant is versus, you know, f searching for this information online is readily available. It's a different, it's a diff different type of picture. Um, so um, the way it works with Canly, the information, if you look into that, their database, judgments will be there, although the content of the judgment, so it could be my name, it could be my medical information, my salary, will not be indexed by Google. So what this Romanian company did, and they're claiming to do this to make sure that, uh, you know, information is free in our society, like something like that. They said, we'll take the judgment, we'll put them online, and we'll wait. So people, you know, were sometimes Googling themselves, or people said, hey, when, did you notice when we Google your name, we can see your medical information from your, your case, your divorce case, or, uh, no, I did not realize this. So they contact the, the Romanian website to say, can you remove my information from your website? Yes, it's going to cost you. And if you want us to remove it more quickly, it's going to cost you even more. So again, uh, we have to, it's, it's you know, the, the, the consent model will only take us so far. We have to kind of uh, reevaluate also, on the, you know, what type of information should be publicly, publicly available. Another point that I, want, I wanted to raise um, on the consent issue is that um, do, users, do users know uh, what they really want? So one example is um, the change that, that uh, took place. In, in the US it was in 2006, and I think in, in the Canada it was a bit later. Um, originally, when, when, um, when Facebook started, everybody had a profile. So when you logged on Facebook, you landed on your profile page. And if you wanted to view somebody else's profile, you had to go on their page. Uh, when people posted things, you had like a mini feed at, at the right, but it wasn't your, you know, it wasn't information that you would see when you when you log on. Then they changed the they changed the product, and I remember not liking it at first. So they changed the product so that when you logged on Facebook, you don't land on your product on your profile page. You land on your news feed, so you see what other people are posting. People reacted negatively to this change. They said, I don't want to see what other people are posting. I want to land on my page. That's what I'm used to. But over time, people saw great value in having, um, in, 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 in viewing what other people are showing instead of landing on their own page. And as a matter of fact, I think, you know, a few years later, um, Facebook has probably more value because of this feature. Right? I don't want to land on my page and see what I have posted. I want to see other, what, what my friends have posted, you know, what kind of picture they're posting, what kind of readings they're doing. I want to see, I want, I, I want to know what's being shared and not what I'm posting. Um, so I like this, this uh, statement from uh, Larry Downs. He was saying, um, today's privacy crisis is a function of innovation that happens too quickly. Given the accelerating pace of new information technology introductions, new uses of information often appear suddenly, perhaps overnight. Still, after the initial panic, we almost always embrace the service that once violated our visceral sense of privacy. The first reaction, what I call the creepy factor, is a frontier response. It doesn't last long. The Puritans reassert the rationale order more quickly all the time. It doesn't mean that we need, it, it's, um, 
I found it interesting because yes, sometimes we panic and, 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 and basically this is taking me to my next, the next part of my presentation, which, which is about uh, the challenges that we have with the fact that our social norms are shifting. I think that's part of the problem. And I see it in my practice in the sense that in the last few years, on many occasions, I had to tell clients that were saying, okay, we're gonna be doing this, what do you think? I'm saying, it's not illegal, but you're gonna freak out your customers. You can't do that. Yeah, but it's okay. We're just gonna make sure we're transparent. No, there's, the, the norm is not in place. People are not gonna like this. So I'm, I'm, we have a new set of problem, and it's the fact that in some, in, you know, to, to some extent, um, we're, not, we're not settled on what is acceptable to us, you know, as consumers, as users. Um, we have a very short time frame um, available for society and the law to react to technological innovation. Um, so before I talk about cameras, I'm going to I'm going to talk about um, the fact that sometimes we th there's social norms that uh, that are well established because we've had years to establish them, and and it, it's almost uh, instinctive, right? When we take an elevator, uh, we know better not to face each other. We're facing the door, and as soon as somebody leaves, you'll notice we kind of like take our space. We just give each other our space. And there's no law, there's no rule. We know it's, it's you know, we, it's, it's been a norm and it's, that, that's how we know to behave. Uh, sometimes we'll change our mind about a technology. So we call when the ID caller um, began uh, be, being com commercialized in the 80s. Uh, some people viewed this, this technology very negatively. They said it, it, the technology is breaching the privacy of the caller because their name is, uh, is displayed. So uh, in some of the U.S. states, they made it illegal. ID caller were illegal in, this, in, in the 80s. And then we've changed our mind, right? 40, 30, 40 years later, um, it's the other way around. You know, if I get a phone call and it's a, it's a blocked number or it's anonymous, I'm thinking it's a telemarketer or it's somebody I don't want to talk to, you know? So we, we have changed, the no social norm has changed. So now uh, let's talk about photogra photography and cameras. Um, so in... Um, um, it was uh, Warren and Brandis who published the famous article, uh, uh, you know, the, the right to privacy, uh, conceptualizing privacy as the right to be let alone. And this was in the context of reporter, reporters having uh, cameras and taking pictures of celebrities, posting them in, in gossip magazines, you know, so, so, or, or yellow journalism. Um, so new, the new, new York Times, I called, um, there was an article in 1902 called Kodakers Lying in the Wait. Um, and at some point uh, in time, we got used to cameras, and we know how to use them and not to use them. Um, okay, may, well, th there's some exception, right? Paparazzis, and you know, sometimes somebody will do something that they're not supposed to do. But overall, I think we were pretty stable for a long period of time, up until everybody started carrying their little iPhones. Um, and now you start searing in, you know, in gym locker rooms, don't use your phone, you cannot take pictures. Of course you can take pictures in a locker room, but the norm was not yet settled. It's a new technology and maybe people lack judgment, who knows, but the norm was not yet, is not quite yet settled. Um, and now you have Google Glasses that are coming, uh, that, are, uh, th that are again going to change uh, the picture. So. Um, Google's ex executive chairman said something uh, last year. He said people will have to develop new eti etiquette to deal with such products that can record video um, and bring up information that only the wearer can see. Uh, so again, he start, he's talking about new etiquette. He's talking about a social norm that will have to evolve. But how long will that take, right? As soon as the, 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 the Google glasses are, are commercially available, um, how long do we need? Six months, three years? Um, 10 years, time will tell. There are a lot of recent technologies and services that are great against social norms, um, although they are not illegal, they're not breaching um, you know, uh, features or settings. Um, consent was probably obtained. Um, so I'm going to give some examples to see how, how these things are evolving. So ambient social apps. So the ability to know um, using you know mobile mobile information loca location information to to disclose to your environment information about you about where you are um, there's tons of applications so one of them uh, that came out in 2012 or 2013 was. 
girls around me. So it was what, what the application did was using information for, from Foursquare and from Facebook. And to, for people that had downloaded the app, it would tell you, uh, um, these are girls around you with their Facebook uh, profile information. So you say, oh, a block away, there's this girl and so on. They didn't breach any privacy settings in the sense that it was, um, it was only girls who had um, made their, pro, uh, public, uh, their, their profile public, I'm sorry. So um, there was a lot of negative reaction, negative publicity, and Foursquare said, no, I don't think we're going to be using this, this app anymore. But uh, what was interesting was the, were the comments under the article where, where this app was being criticized. Um, some people said, it's, it's in, what, what's the problem? It's for non-tech savvy women. People expected, again, women to be super users and to be aware and to have the privacy settings in place, not to be, um, if they did, didn't want to be part of a, that, that kind of service. Another one said, perfectly legit, but creepy mobile app. Um, one, one comment said, just fix your privacy settings, right? Again, we expected women to fix their privacy settings, you know, again, be super users. Um, and, and there was a lot of th th these types of comments. One said, public venue and public channel, it's like going out in public naked and complaining that people look at you. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure about that one. And, and um, one comment I thought was really interesting was, I remember when uh, many young women called Facebook creepy and stalking when it first went online in 2004. There you go. So we have evolved. We have, you know, so in, in some cases it's okay, in some cases it's not okay. Um, but what do we have to rely on? Sometimes it's, it's our intuition. Personalized um, analytics. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, you know, there's a new, new types of products also that uh, would allow, for instance, a parent to monitor exactly what's going on in their house. Um, the, you know, in some kids, so there was there was a product called uh, Sky Dog, so you can monitor the, the bandwidth and the type of um, the type of uh, use. You, you know how many devices are connected, how long they're connected, what type of websites are being visited. You can block and say, I have 30 minutes Facebook, and then I'm going to block. You know, no more access to my kid. Uh, but again, is it breaching some form of norm? You know, in, in, in our day and age, uh, if we wanted some, some privacy from our parents, we would go in our room and close the door. Now, is, the, is this breaching a norm? You know, something to think about. Data-driven marketing. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the t target story because it was, it, was, it was a famous, but it's, it's one of these examples where uh, we know more, we're using information to, for, for marketing purposes, and it's, it's, it's changing the picture a little bit. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there was a, um, an application called uh, Scene Tap, and I think it's still around in Boston. There's about 30, 30 bars in Boston that have this application. So basically what it does when you walk into um, the bar, it scans your face and it says, okay, this is a middle-aged woman. They know the, the gender and they know the, the age, uh, the approximate age. So if you have this app and you want to go to a certain bar that is using uh, Scene Tap, you can know, okay, this is a bar for, you know, for college students, I'm not going to go there. Oh, there's only men, I'm not going to go there. So you can have an idea of the scene. Very useful, right? Um, they got a lot of letters, a lot of concern, and they said, no, we're being very transparent. People walk into the bar. We're, we're, you know, we're being very clear with the fact that we're going to be scanning their face. It's not personal information. We're not retaining this information. It's an aggregate. It's to provide an overview of the, the scene. Uh, but it just comes to, to, to tell you that, or to show that there's new types of uh, advertising techniques or, or analytics taking place that, that are kind of cha changing the picture. Um, also, there was Intel and another carrier in, the, in Europe Vodafone, if I recall, um, they were uh, working with retailers to provide um, in retail stores very uh, personalized advertising. So you're, if you're in front of a, of a product, there's a display, will scan your face and they'll say, okay, that's a female, she's between 50, you know, 40 and 50, and the, sc the screen will go pink and I'll have, you know, some, some advertisement teller to my age. Um, does that, is that disturbing? Maybe, maybe not. Is, it, is this information kept? We're, we're not yet, we're not there, right? We're not ready. Maybe we will be. 
Um, it, it's a matter of time. And, and the last uh, type of technology that I want to discuss is social listening. Uh, so social listening is, uh, you know, has been used, is, is, is currently be used, be, being used by a lot of organizations. Uh, they're monitoring Twitter, they're mo mo monitoring social media to find out more about customers. Sometimes it's to address a crisis. You know, somebody's complaining about their product on Twitter. They want to perhaps jump into the conversation and try to, to address the issue. There's all kinds of purposes or, or understanding the vibe of the crowd, you know, in, in, with regards to a certain new feature, one of their product. Um, there was um, a British Airways who had, um, they had the Nomi program a few years ago. So what they had done was give an iPad to a lot of their employees and they said, you better know clients. So when clients board, you're gonna have their pictures loaded up, you're gonna know who they are, what kind of complaints they filed in the past, um, and people, so these employees were expected to, to greet these people saying, hello, mister, you know, with their name, and we know that you like this type of, of meal. And some people reacted negatively and said, I don't want, you know, these employees like check, checking me out or checking out my, my, my information on social media. Um, but perhaps, again, a norm, the normal change. So maybe in 10 years, uh, people will walk into a, an, an airport lounge and say, Do, don't you know who I am? You know, it's just, it's, it's a norm, it's evolving, and we have to kind of stay, uh, stay alert to these changes. So social li listening is, is, is interesting because 32 people, 32 percent of consumers have no idea companies are listening. That, that dates back to two years ago, so maybe people are more and more aware. Um, but there was a study, a, a joint study made between NetBase and GD Power, and it's interesting because it shows that we, we're not sure as users where we're at with social listening. So 51% uh, of consumers wanted to be able to talk about companies without them listening. Um, and 43% thought that corporate listening intruded on their privacy. Yet 48% would allow companies to listen if the goal is to improve their product. 58% of consumers believe that businesses should respond to complaints in social media. So if I'm filing a complaint on Twitter, I expect an air, the airline company that I'm criticizing to kind of jump in and address the problem. Um, but 64% wanted companies to only speak to them when spoken to. So you see 50%, 60%, we're not sure, we're not sure what we like it yet. Uh, and maybe we'll decide as a society that we don't want, you know, social listening at all. Uh, again, it's a norm and it's, it, and it's evolving. Um, so what's the link between part one and part two? Um, if there is no social norm, transparency will fail, right? You can be as, as transparent as you want and be very, you know, uh, disclose everything that you're doing in a privacy policy, but if there's no norm or if, you, if, if, if what you're doing is creepy, uh, transparency will not be successful. So what should we do? So um, I don't have all the answers, <laughs> like lowering the bar. I don't have all the answers, uh, but I'm, I just want to share a few thoughts with you. Um, there's uh, Jean Carbonnier, who's a famous uh, French jurist who passed away a few years ago. Um, he had put together a chair in uh, for, um, law and soci sociology, um, and he was always promoting a very flexible legal system. And there's a famous quote of his who says, ne légiférez qu'en tremblant. So what this means is when you're enacting a, a new law, you should be very nervous, you should be shaking. Why? Because it's a big deal. Once we enact a law, we're stuck with it and it becomes much more rigid. Um, so think about it before you, you make sure that you, 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 you get, you get you know, a, a certain norm, legal norm stuck in time. Um, so should we change our laws? Um, I'm not sure. Again, I, f I feel that maybe it's too early in, so in some cases to be changing our laws. We st we're still assessing these changes. Um, and, and just to give an example, in Europe with the cookie directive, um, I think it was a big fail. You know, people were visiting uh, European websites and you need, you need to click to agree to, to have them use a cookie. It's, it's in interfering with our use of the web. We don't want that. Uh, I think we're okay with website using cookies for certain purposes, so maybe we should get notification only when it's for purposes that we don't like. Uh, but again, maybe it's too early, I find, to, to be, um, to be uh, le legislating on, on cookies and website. We're still at the, at the stage where we're, we're seeing what's, what's happening. Another one, another new right that we, we saw in the last year that, uh, and, it, and is also included in the European reform is the right to be forgotten. Um, and I have no issue with, um, you know, a young person, they, they were partying when they were a teenager and they're looking for a job, they want some information removed, of course, you know. But my, the issue that I have is that um, I'm concerned that 
so if you look at these types of requests on an individual basis, they make sense, you know, you want to make sure this person can, but if you look at it on a, a broader, you know, if you look at, if, if every person uh, every year makes some of these requests and it's the whole population, it's over a period of 20 years, 30 years, are we going to be censoring the web? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I, I think we should be very cautious on the type of criteria that we use to remove information that, that is av available on the web. So I'm not against it, but I'm saying we have to, we have to be cautious. So what should be the role of regulation in the absence of a stable social norms? I'm not sure. Uh, should, should we focus on law, softer social norms? Should, we, uh, should regulation drive or be driven by volatile individual expectation, mar market best practice, and social norm? Um, I'm not sure, but one thing's for sure, I think we should be asking ourselves these types of questions. Um, so I'm leaving you with one one quote. I thought it was it was interesting. It just it is just showing that people uh, we're not we're not we're, we're still at a stage where we're not sure uh, where certain business models are going. Um, the success of the internet has, in large part, been driven by the freedom to experiment with different business models, the best of which have survived and thrived, even in the face of initial unfamiliarity and unease about the impact on consumers. So my message today is uh, we need, um, and the Privacy Commissioner have been doing these polls, we need to listen to users, uh, we, we need to get their pulse and their, their input, and, and, and find out a little bit more uh, what is acceptable to them, what is not acceptable to them. So, um, Privacy Commissioner, like I said, I've been doing these polls, uh, th these public consultation, and I think it's, it's, it's going to, these types of exercises are going to be more and more important. Thank you.